In the last video, we covered the landings and the captures of Attu Island and Kiska, which was so badly bungled that Time magazine printed a newly coined slang term, Janfu, or Joint Army Navy Foul Up, created just for that occasion. As we follow Squadron 13 into 1944, let's just note for a moment that nighttime temperatures for January 44 average 23 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a cold and clammy 23 degrees at that. Now you add a 55 knot wind, and with wind chill, you're at 0 degrees Fahrenheit. Viewer David Otnes points out that those passes between the islands generate huge, unpredictable waves as the tide is running in either direction as the water from the Bering Sea comes out of the deep to churn on over into the Pacific side. Same is true when it comes from the Pacific to the Bering Sea side. See how many times the warnings tide rips or swirls and rips appear on these charts. So many of the coastlines feature warnings about kelp or foul bottom and mariners are warned not to approach entire islands. Landmarks and features are labeled position doubtful or even existence doubtful and these are the current modern day charts. Now let's just keep those factors in mind as we go ahead and look at the calamities to come. Also, I am not a native Alaskan, so if I mangle more place names, please bear with me. 5th of January 1944. PT-73 rings in the new year by going aground on Ermac Bight while attempting to anchor during a snow squall with winds gusting to 55 knots. Shortly after, PT-76 replicated the feat and washed up right alongside 73. An hour and a half later, on the rising tide, both boats came off without assistance. PT-73 had bent two rudders and all three propellers. PT-76 had similar damage, with the addition of some planking scraped off of the hull. Both boats had to be dry docked for repairs. January 11, 1944, PT-79 and 80 collide while on tactical exercises with the loss of one depth charge and its rack. Most of the month is spent on anti-aircraft and docking exercises and slowly upgrading the other boats in the squadron with the new torpedoes, launchers and adding 20mm cannons to the 50 cals of the turrets. January 24th. Ready in all aspects, PT-73 returns to active duty. February 8th, PT-81 is upgraded to the new Mark I Model 1 torpedo tubes of 22.5 inches and has the 20mm cannons added. Valentine's Day 1944. Four boats, PT-73, 76, 82 and 83 take part in an anti-aircraft exercise where five Fort Kingfisher aircraft simulate strafing, glide bombing and skip bombing attacks on the boats. The boats practice evasion tactics and anti-aircraft fire in retaliation. February 16th. Further anti-aircraft exercises are again scrubbed due to poor weather. Failure of the supercharger bearing is observed on PT-82's engines. Further exercises are cancelled until superchargers on all boats can be inspected. Night patrols were cancelled through the end of the month due to high winds. March 2nd, at Finger Bay, ADAC, PD-2 has an engine casualty. March 11th, all boats in Division 39 have now been upgraded with the 20mm cannons and the new 22-inch torpedo tubes. This signals the end of the 21-inch Mark 8 torpedo. A new hull repair workshop is finally completed on March 18th after five months of work. PD-77 is the first customer at the new facility. It had become standard practice to allow prolonged idling to keep the engine oil warm to allow the engines to start more easily. Aside from being a massive waste of fuel, this is leading to damaged superchargers and fouling of spark plugs. So on March 23rd, this program is ceased. It's seen that moisture in the intake air is condensing on the bearings, causing them to rust and fail. March 26, the squadron ran tests of the Mark 13 torpedo using USS Austin as a target. Four dummy torpedoes fired for four misses. The torpedoes all hooked left for a while before running straight. Lack of heater tubes for the gyros is blamed for this. 28th March, the torpedo tests are repeated with USS Charleston as a target. 
four torpedoes fired, four again no hits. After the tests, the boats attempt to anchor in strong winds, and PT-82 is blown onto a beach at low tide, where it's pulled off by PD-73. Again, this requires three new propellers. April 11th. Beginning this date, nightly anti-submarine actions are ordered and commence with a patrol between Adak Island and Chugal Pass. 14th April, during a sweep northeast of Adak, a light was seen and a radar contact was made. Closing in on the initial contact, it disappeared from radar and an extended search came up with nothing. With a 30 knot wind and a sea state of 6, it seemed to raise a question in someone's mind how useful the radar was in these conditions. Just four days later, the anti-submarine patrols are suspended due to worsening weather. April 23rd, PT-73 is taken into the workshop for hull repairs. During this last week of April, many tests were conducted on the effectiveness of radio communications and the ability of the SO radar to detect submarines, in which much was learned about what the radar sets could and couldn't detect. Several live ammo anti-aircraft drills were carried out. Foul weather caused most of the nightly anti-submarine patrols to be scrubbed, however, and when you see how poorly the radar would work in any significant shop, you can see why. May 1st, PT-73 finally leaves the hull repair shop with the repairs complete. Other boats are either running drills or being dry docked one by one and taken for repairs. By the beginning of May, it's become clear that the Japanese are not coming back anytime soon, and the weather up here is not conducive to PT boat ops anyway. It's decided to move the boats to one of the new fronts opening up to the south. On May 7th, 1944, a movement order was received ordering the boats transferred to Seattle, Washington. I guess someone decided that the boats drove up here on their own bottoms so they can drive back again. I also guess that that certain someone didn't really look at the weather reports. Squadron 13 starts transferring in two groups of six boats each. On this first day of the trip, PT-77 struck a submerged object somewhere around Amutka Island, damaging another propeller. This forced the starboard engine to be shut down and the boat to fall behind the group, only being able to make 12 knots on two engines. This really sets the tone for the rest of the trip. It won't be until October that all of the boats in the squadron are together again. The second group of boats, PT-73 through 78, depart the next day along much the same route, stopping at Atka for more fuel. PT-77 was quickly repaired in dry dock at Dutch Harbour on Amaknak Island. May 10th, en route to Cold Bay in dense fog, PT-79 and 80 collide again, badly damaging 79. The estimate is two weeks to repair her. May 11th, PT-74 struck a submerged object, damaging the center propeller. May 12th, while entering Women's Bay in Kodiak, PT-73 runs aground on a sandbar and is pulled off without much incident, but bends two propellers in the incident. Now perhaps we see why there are just so many propellers laid out in this footage. For reference, it's almost 1,000 nautical miles from ADAC to Women's Bay alone. This doesn't end PT-73's dramas. While the undamaged boats proceed on a 571 nautical mile straight shot across open ocean to Juneau, come 18th of May 1944, PT-73 is again down to two engines. After the center shaft was bent, the vibration caused its packing gland to leak water when running, threatening to flood the engine compartment. Once at Juneau, most of the sailing is through channels and sheltered inland waterways, so you'd assume the drama's to be over by that point. Come 23rd of May 1944, and after limping her to Ketchikan, divers find that PT-73 again has two bent propellers that need to be replaced. The other boats are traveling from Ketchikan to Annette Island, Alert Bay in British Columbia, Patricia Bay and on to Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. On May 25th, boats start arriving at Keyport Washington Naval Torpedo Station, also known as Torpedo City, 
for the unloading of torpedoes. PT-73 and 78 are in Bella Bella. Meanwhile, PT-79 and 80 are still all the way back in Cold Bay, which is 1,200 nautical miles away as the crow flies. PTs 79 and 80 do not finally arrive in Puget Sound Naval Yard, Bremerton, until the 5th of June 1944, after an arduous month-long 2,400 nautical mile slog. During the month of June, all boats will start the process of overhauls to repair all of the wear and damage done in the trip from Alaska. Given the distance they've been driven, I'm pretty sure that they would have all gotten fresh engines. I don't know how many new propellers were on the bill, but I bet it was plenty. 14th July 1944, and PT-82 is loaded aboard the SS Mission Buenaventura en route to San Francisco. Many new crew members are received both at Bremerton and San Francisco. A few transfer out to other duties or go off to hospital and one deserts. There's not going to be much of a respite for the crews, however. That's as far as we're going to follow PT-73 and Squadron 13 for this video. In the next episode, we will catch up with them again in New Guinea.